Welcome everyone to James Live Behind Enemy Lines. For those that have watched the first part, that was at Eastgate Assembly of God in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. For those that haven't seen it, we'll post that link in the description. But this is a part two, a continuation of that story. Uh, and that one I shared uh, most of the timeline of my personal testimony. I didn't cover quite everything, but I gave an overview of most of what I've been through. For this part though, we're going to focus mostly on what it means to be behind enemy lines and what it means to seek out what God has for you in his life. And what I mean by that, seeking out what God has for you in your life, we're looking at 1 Peter 5.8. We're going to read this and then we'll pray. It says, be sober and diligent because the, the adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion who walks around seeking whom he may devour. And I mentioned this verse in part one, and I wanted to start with this moment about if we already are Christians and we're already operating as the body of Christ, we're already saved, we've been involved with the ministry and doing different things, or maybe you're just going through the motions, you haven't gotten quite saved yet. You must realize that Satan and the demons, the devils, the things going out in this world, and even just humans in general, are looking for the weakest link, looking for someone that's able to take someone out and destroy someone and move in such a way that can cause people to struggle and have issues in their lives where they're not able to do what God has called them to. And when you have these moments and you understand that you're behind the enemy lines, you're behind this situation that you realize you're in this world you're not of this world god will come in in such a way that you're able to do what he's called you to do let us pray heavenly father lord jesus christ we come before you right now we just ask you god to just open the doors to our minds and our hearts to our families to our friends that we'll be able to move forward and do the things that you called us to do so we can seek out where you want us to be and how you want us to operate as the body of Christ, that we understand that once we're saved, we're not of this world, we just live in this world, and this world is not our home. By the mighty name of Jesus Christ and as we pray, amen. Our next verse that I want to look at, this is going to be in Job, and we're going to look at this verse again. These are several verses that I covered in the first part, but I want to look at this again to a different mind's eye, so to speak, and what we're going to talk about for this story. For this session, for this ministry opportunity here on James C. Live. So again, Job 1 and 7. This is about where the Lord's talking to Satan and asking where he's been and where's things going around in earth. And he's walking around checking things out, seeing how things are happening in the earth and how things are going on. And this dialogue, as I said, at it hurts. It continues to go on till today. And we also see that. Here in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we're part of God, but the whole world is in this wicked moment, in this moment that we just don't really understand. So you got to understand, too, what is it that Satan is and how Satan operates. Well, when we look at what Satan was, we see in Revelation 12, 9, we talk about he's the great dragon who was cast out. Other descriptions talk about how Lucifer was designed Imagine a pipe organ with all these pipes and all these instruments coming about him and he was in charge of all this music. He was in charge of worshiping, you know, God and he got to this point where he had a free will choice and made a decision that, well, you know, I don't want to just worship God. I don't want to just, you know, be in this moment. I want to actually move in such a way and take over. His position, I don't need a, don't need him anymore. I don't need, and it, I mean, there's so many different answers of what he would go through. But you see this, the big thing here in Revelation 12, 9 is about deceiving the whole world. And that he was cast onto the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So first he ends up making this decision to want to take over God's role. And then he starts talking to his friends that are involved in the worship team and then in other groups and things like that. You may see this pattern happening right now. A good example that, that I, I, I come up with as an analogy, so to speak, for this situation is think about The Voice or things like American Idol or those that are in band and choir and you got to learn a piece of music and there's other people 
that are out in the hallway and they're practicing and you're hearing them then they come together for a room to review and whatnot and then you finally get a number and you just stand in line and then you go practice and maybe you're in front of the judges maybe you're behind a sheet maybe maybe you're just in an enclosed space and they can hear it through a mic i don't know but the point of the matter is there's all this competition all this different noise all these different things that are coming about us and in such a way it's like what's drowning out who we are and what we're about and how we're operating, where we're going and what we're doing. That's what Satan does. He has a big rap battle. He has a big rock concert. He has a big orchestra, a symphony. He has a big football game, a wrestling game going on, a ballet. Those of you who are not in this world, maybe it's the bar, the strip club or some other kind of place. That's captivated your attention. That's drawn you in. And deceives your heart, mind, and soul. Where, I mean, think about it. You can grab your phones today, right now. You can grab a phone. And you can look at how much time you've been on each application. You can do the same thing on your computer. You can look on your computer and see how much time you spent on the internet. You can look at your data plan. How much data have you spent on the internet? What are you doing on the internet? How much time have you spent driving? How much gas is left in your tank car? When's the last time you bought gas? How much food is in your refrigerator? How many dirty clothes do you have? Satan has all these things, and I'm using these examples of uh, distraction examples, of real world examples, of kind of something you would relate to what he's doing. In other words, he wants you to be occupied with your time in such a way and in such a manner that you don't have time to do anything else. If we look at 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, If anyone is a new, is a man being Christ, he's a new creature, so the old things are passed away, and you become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 is talking about the old way, being born again, transforming your life into somebody else. But the problem is, how many times have we actually sat around and listened to what God wants to do in our lives, and maybe we're not. Like I said, this is behind enemy lines. What are you doing? When you're behind enemy lines, you realize there's going to be things in this world, as we're looking at John 15, 19, things in this world that are going to come to you in such a way that what happens? The world ends up, the culture ends up, the family, the friends, the co-workers, fellow students, teachers, professors, CEOs, anyone else and ends up coming about in what kind of a way? Well, let's look at John 15, 19 to answer that question. If you're in the world, the world would love his own. Meaning, if you're part of the culture, you're part of what's regularly going on in society. And we're talking about society of not being involved with any Christian Foundation, not believing in Jesus Christ, not being born again, not worshiping, not, you know, performing signs, wonders, miracles, and all the different things that Christ talks about and his disciples. It says, because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, so therefore the world will hate you. And we're not talking about you just get saved, everybody's going to hate you. There will still be some people that aren't saved that are going to be friendly, but there's still going to be another group of you. That will want to secretly record people's conversations, gossip behind people's backs, take pictures and videos and different things and use them against people to try and take things into context and out of context, cause chaos and discord, and more specifically, target you because you are just a Christian and they don't want your voices heard, they don't want your message shared, they don't want anything to happen behind enemy lines. If you think about from being behind enemy lines, in a war... And they realize that you're different, you're not a part, you're not like carrying over to the other side, and they find out who you're doing. What happens in a war? They they will come after you. They will try and stop you. 
They will arrest you. They may kill you or send you somewhere else or do some kind of other thing to you. What do you think Satan and the demons have plans for us? They have plans for us every single day from the moment we're awake to the moment we're asleep. Like when I do this show, there are things that happen that are distractions and problems. Either Miranda gets sick, something happens to me, something happens to the dog, something's caught on the cameras outside, Something, a phone call comes in, a text message, an email. There's always something going on to try and stop this show from ever happening. And it's not just my show, but it's church. Regular Sunday mornings, Wednesday services, things to try to stop the pastor, the special speaker, the singers, everything else. We're constantly under some kind of warfare, some kind of situation that causes us to what? Have to struggle. But we realize, like 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10 talks about. It says, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders. Yeah, Satan can perform versions of miracles and things. How else can he deceive someone? It's like a musician doing auto-tune or having a secret track playing in the background. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that will perish because they receive not the truth of the love of that they might be saved. See, when you realize what's happening on in this earth and what's happening on in this world, what do you see? What do you see happen? You see so many situations come about that causes too many problems in the world to try and put you in the world and make you captivated by the world and take you out. One of the biggest ones... For anyone who's a grandparent or great-grandparent, they would say the radio needed to be turned off. If you're a grandparent or a parent, they're going to say it's the TV that needs to be turned off. If you're younger, it's your cell phone, it's your tablet, it's your computer, it's your video game. Distractions. Things that come in our lives... That try and stop us from doing what Christ wants to do in our lives. Now, if you are behind an enemy line, what is the purpose of you being behind enemy line? Is it by accident? You don't accidentally, it's not like you're sitting here in the United States and another country declares war and you're automatically on war with that country or Civil War, that city versus that city, that state versus that state. You didn't necessarily have the authority to make these decisions, but you're told to make a choice. See, the problem is, too many times what we run into is we run into a situation where you don't make any decisions. Now, the one big piece about being a Christian is it is your free will choice to become a Christian. Now the problem is sometimes some people only know just that basic part and they may not be shown anything else or they unfortunately do what a lot of people do. They get saved. I'm a Christian. I'm good to go. I check that off my list and go on with their life and just do whatever they're going to do. What happens with that situation? You're not prepared in and out of seasons I talked about on first part. You're not able to justly do what God has called you to do. Now in society today, in the culture today, we're coming up with icons. We're coming up with trophies. We're coming up with images and things to idolize people and draw them to a complex, top-tiered moment where they're gone viral with their video or they're on the radio, they're on TV. Again, it's about your time. See, when you're behind enemy lines and you're really wanting to bring forth the message of Christ to the earth, 
and you're really wanting to see people get saved, you have this sense of urgency to want to read the Word, to want to spend time in prayer, to want to not just open a, a book on Sunday and sing about bringing in the sheaves, set the book down on the desk, in the pew, and go home, and then there's no more worship at your house. Now, do we send people out in physical war and say, okay, every one of these 1,000 people, you're going to go on this boat? No, we don't have a boat. You're going to swim across the 1,000 thousand miles. No, they're put in a boat. Well, you know, when you get off the boat, you know, you're going to go fight those people. Um, I, no, we're not going to train you. We don't have time for that. You're just going to go over there and do that. Um, yeah, you're going to jump out of a helicopter, but you're not going to have a parachute. No, the thing of the matter is when you get saved and God's wanting to do something in your life, you should have this, like I said, sense of urgency. You should feel this in your heart and in your mind and in your soul and in your physical being. You should be wanting to be tasked, to want to worship. That it's not some kind of you're an endless drone robot saying the same thing over and over again, but you're going to want to read the word and pray and talk to God and worship and do different things to find out what God has for you for each and every single day of your life. But if you can't do that, then what's holding you back? Again, behind enemy lines, what is captivating you? What is holding you back from doing what God wants to do in your life? And here's another way of looking at it. Revelation 13 Verses 13 and 14. Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. This is where he does great wonders and makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceives them that are on earth by the means of these miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that are on earth, they should make an image to this beast which had been wounded by a sword and lived. So we see in this verse, 13 and 14, that what happens is this beast is coming down. It's going to be in a public situation. It's going to get hurt. It's going to survive and heal. It's going to do all these amazing things. It's going to be this, this, this person, this beast, this situation. is going to be some grand, smart person. We're talking about the Antichrist now at this point. A smart person come along and solve all these different problems with finances and uh, problems with uh, water and problems with electricity and problems with different groups and so on and so forth and everyone's going to like this person it's going to be well rehearsed and well versed and well liked well spoken well looked upon people will comment on how good that it looks and how good it smells how good it sounds how much money they got out of it, how much situation, all these different things. And then all this stuff is going to continue to go on and on and on and on until it gets to this point where people are going to want to present it as a god, as an idol, as a being that is beyond all beings, a miracle worker. And it will deceive the world. And it will be a person. It will be an ideology. It will be a political thing. It will be something kids will understand. Something that old people will understand. The working class. The non-working class. Everybody is going to be deceived by this. <clears throat> and why? Because at this point, the amount of people that are following God are very few. As it talks about here that the world is going to become deceived and the world is going to get in such a way where it's not going to want to talk about God. And we're seeing that in many countries today. And even here in the U.S. where people don't want to have anything to do with Jesus anymore. I remember at one point when we did this show, we had thousands of people show up. That doesn't happen anymore. I can tell you the number right now of how many showed up and left, and you would not believe it.
Why, though? Because the world has gotten darker. But as I said, and I've said many times, as the world continues to get darker, we go down this dark path. The light of Christ becomes brighter. Why? Because he's coming back to planet Earth and bringing the angels. You got to understand this. As the Earth gets darker, this is the Earth. And it's getting darker, symbolizing by my hand being closed. And it's almost closed. You see a little, little tiny hole, right? You could probably stick your finger through it, right? And then here comes Jesus with his angels. So this darkness here isn't as dark because it's getting closer. When we talk about the time is near, we're talking about the distance between earth and Jesus and the angels. How far is that physical distance is gradually getting closer and closer, minute by day by year. And in human eyes, we're like, well, shouldn't it like be like a day? Shouldn't he've already been here like a day or a couple of days or whatnot? It doesn't work like that. We're given a chance to try and make something of ourselves here on planet Earth. We're given a chance to try and correct the wrongs that maybe our generations before us have done and go on a path so then that great asteroid doesn't come and destroy us and all these plagues and pestilences and financial problems don't destroy us. But everything that you see in the Old and New Testament, what happens? A minister, an apostle, a missionary... Worship leader, whatever title or just a follower of Christ that's serious, normally says something like this. Woe, you leaders of planet Earth. You have failed to repent of your sins. You must bow down and repent and repent as your nation, repent as your city, Repent as your family and turn back to God or beware of plagues and pestilences and fire come down from heaven, rain come down from the earth, flooding, earthquakes, volcanoes, illnesses, and great death will become upon your city in your country if you do not repent. And how many times have we seen that in the Old Testament? How many times have we seen that happen in the New Testament? And right now in 2021, how many ministers and missionaries and worship leaders and pastors around the world have preached a message that has said that phrase? They have either pulled up a Bible verse on the screen that said it, reading the Old and New verses, or they have just had a conversation just like we're having right now, about this situation that we're currently in. Again, 2021, October 2nd, on a Saturday at 8.33 p.m. Eastern Time, here in Ohio, and Reynoldsburg, Bryce, Columbus, Ohio area. Woe, you leaders of Ohio. You are not following God. You must repent. Or you will perish and die. And I guarantee you, majority of people that would hear that phrase, the next sentence that would come out of their mouth would be a laugh and ignore, or you would get cussed out, or they would say, you are crazy. That ain't going to happen. I'm fine where I'm at. I'm doing just great. It's not that bad. Or I, I've been praying, you know, you know, I, I believe God is going to, you know, um, Take care of it all. Our days have been shorter. The shipping and receiving situation has gone astray. The plagues and pestilences have increased around the world. More earthquakes and volcanoes and disasters, natural disasters are occurring. More tsunamis and hur hurricanes are happening. More tornadoes. More flooding. 
It's not by accident. It's by design. God's blueprint for this world was quite simply that he created this world, created things that would automatically worship him, but us as human beings, we had a choice. And as we discussed just a moment ago about Satan and his followers, his demons and those, made a choice, and God casted them out of heaven and put them down here on earth, and they're roaming all around earth, oppressing and oppressing people and ideologies all the time and they have capabilities that human beings don't have we are more limited than they are and what we're capable of doing on our own now must understand this on our own but when Christ comes in your life, and again, as I said, when you are a Christian and you're following what God is doing, what changes in your life? Everything, right? And you realize that you are actually limited in your own capabilities. There are things that you can do basic bodily things you can do basic ways you can think learn communicate but someone had to teach you many of those things how to speak how to dress someone taught you words and math and how to read and different things like that so if you're a Christian and you just did that cut off I got saved and you got nothing else or you are a Christian and this stuff has got you scared. What are you relying upon at this point? You are behind enemy lines. You are on the domain of Satan and his demons. This planet Earth, he's king of planet Earth. Now, before I talk about what God can do, understand what you're in, what circumstance that you are in. Why Christ won't relent in your life. Why he reigns forever and evermore. When you realize the circumstances of things you've been through, it will change what happens to you. Now, we've looked at this Bible verse before, and I have to bring it up again and, and discuss it in a different way. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. About the whole armor of God. About the why, about what the devil is doing. Because you're not fighting against a human, but a lot of times, many of you would say, Yes, Jeremy, I'm having to deal with a human being. They're saying this, they're doing this to me. This was done to me. You gotta dig deeper to the root. Why are they saying what they're saying? Why are they acting the way they're acting? As verse 12 talks about principalities, darknesses, and rulers of the darkness in the world. And spiritual wickedness in all these high places. So we're talking about leaders and different things of that kind of nature. And in verse 13 we're talking about withstanding in the evil day, having done all to stand. Now to stand... Sometimes requires a lot of patience. And it's not always just patience that has to be done. If you're behind enemy lines, this is also like a, a battle plan, a game plan. Communicating with the most difficult one that you dealt with. What do you do? How do you move? And quite simply, I can tell you how 
they can move and how they can operate. You got to change the battle plan up a lot of times. What I mean by that is if you're speaking a certain way or not speaking a certain way and your facial expressions are a certain way, how much time you spent in prayer, how much time you spent listening to worship, how much time have you spent singing worship songs to God, how much time you spent reading the Bible, and how much time have you spent being quiet after you ask God, here am I, what do you want to tell me, if you haven't changed that time frame and increased the amount of your God time, then you won't be able to do this because a lot of times you're in a situation where you can't just pull out a Bible. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where I didn't have a Bible in front of me. And you have to do act on impulse last minute decisions quite fire rapidly over and over and over again. Other times you can make plans or it's the situation already happened and you already made the mistake or you think you made a mistake and you're doing a review let's check in and review what happened and how did that situation occur and what came out of it and then you do that next follow up which is lessons learned what could I have done differently we're constantly in this situation. Now the most common, one of the most common situations a lot of people want to think about when it comes to the devil is what caused the legion to come together and attack the man? And we see other Bible verses that talks about this in similar ways where the devil is cast out of somebody or the demon, the situation, you know, the devil no longer has the power over that moment. But then you either hear it roar or you hear someone describe uh, actual verbal conversations where it says it'll come back with even more groups like the legion of demons and attack the individual, attack the circumstance, attack the family, attack the job, attack the transportation, attack your health. It's just like a football game or like a wrestling thing or, or like a fighting situation. You know, if you've ever seen a fight in school and one person is getting beat up by the other one and they both have friends, the friends join in. Ever watched an old country movie, an old western and they're in the bar and someone gets hit in the head with a bottle, normally everyone in the bar is fighting on the show. Just like a football game. The ball is thrown. The person catches it. They're running down the field. One person is trying to tackle. The rest of the team, the defense is trying to go against the person on the offense that has the ball. And they're all trying to tackle that person. And a lot of times, what do you see in the game? They're all laid on top of that one person trying to get the ball and trying to stop them. Now, does it really take five, six, seven, eight men to take one person out? You would think it does. The devil is the same way. Each time that we resist the devil, each time that we take a stand and say, no, I'm not going to talk this way. I'm not going to watch this. I'm not going to read this. I'm not going to go there. We're going to change this. We're going to spend more time in the word of God. We're going to do what God wants to do. What happens? The devil goes back and he opens up his battle plan. He'll open up some kind of battle plan, you know. He'll open up a book, you know, and he's all like, let me look at my shortcut cliff notes. I'm all like, okay, we've already done pages 1 through 86. All right, and then let's look at 87, 88, 89. Oh, wait a minute. Let's just throw the whole book at him. Let's mix it up. It's caused distractions, chaos, discord, confusion, frustration, anger, depression, worry, sadness, death, loss of jobs, illnesses, homelessness. The list goes on and on of things that can happen to a person in a situation. Gossip. 
Gossip seems to be the biggest traveler of division in the church and in people's lives and their family than anything else. Because that thing the devil wants to do, it has to be communicated with over and over again. So then you have original story here, but by the end of it, you got 10 different versions of the same thing. And each version ends up being worse than what the first one was. Nobody knows what the truth is. The truth isn't. Or it's like what the devil says. He's a great deceiver. I've had people in my lives that were great deceivers. They, um, they would go out in the public eye. And they would be really great and good with who they are. And how they operated. But behind closed doors. They were cursing. They were physically abusive. They were beating people. They were raping people. And they were killing people. That I met when I was homeless, that I met when I was a kid, when I met when I was the, and, and, and staying with the Salvation Army and other places, and even in the military, people that had different kinds of situations in their lives. But that wasn't who they really were. Again, behind enemy lines. You understand what the tactics of the devil and the demons do, and then you understand the tactics of what God and the angels and what the body of Christ can do. And then you more specifically understand where is your part in the body of Christ? What does God, what gifts, what abilities, what capabilities, what things you have in your life that God can do to transform your life, to bring him, bring him close to you, but take it another step. How can you reach other people for Christ? How can you transform your family, your school, your business, your community, your state, your nation, your world? It's all about those time increments. If you pulled up a pie chart or, or, or some kind of other capable analytical means to show a 24-hour period or 7-day period or 10-year period and you were able to look at all this information. This is what's going to happen when the book of life is opened up. God's going to have all these stats and figures of all the things that we have done and not done. And what's Christ and God going to say in those moments for us? Well, you got saved, you're behind enemy lines and you sat in your home and you watch TV all day while all your neighbors and everybody else died and everybody just moved on and you missed opportunities to talk about God. That's the problem. So many of us are scared to share our testimonies because so many of us will say, well, I don't have anything really that significant to say other than my parents took me to church or I was a pastor's kid or I was this and nothing really crazy happened in my life but I got saved and that's okay but when's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody either at a grocery store or at a business or in your apartment complex or in your own home on the phone in a text message too many of us would say today Jeremy I, I've never done that. I, I, I've never, I've never, you know, I've never talked about God. I've never, I never listened to what God wanted. I never took the time to, to seek his face and, and to honor him. Why is that? Why are we that way? And I can tell you why we're that way. We have been designed and created way beyond before America even existed to not really want to talk about Jesus Christ. A lot of people haven't said that name except for when they dropped a hammer on their foot. Or at all. They don't know how to communicate about God. They don't know how to talk about Jesus.
Here are 10 things you should be grateful for, for Jesus. Can you answer that? That's your homework for those of you who want to be able to move that next step in your walk with Christ. I want you to come up with 10 reasons to be thankful in Jesus that you can share to anyone else. A text message, a phone call, a social media post, or verbally in person, or written and sent in a letter in the mail. You got to start somewhere. Why not now? We're living in a fallen and darkened world that's going to get darker every day of our lives. And each generation is going to look at it differently, but the same process is going to continue to occur. It's going to continue, continue, continue to be a darker, darker darkness every year. It's not like 1856 and it's 2021 and the light switch went off. No, it's a slow dim. It's a slow fade. It's a slow movement and what God is doing and what Satan is doing. Or it could be like a wildfire of the gospel spread amongst the four corners of the earth. If you allow Jesus Christ to transform you from the inside out and you go forward and you spread the gospel amongst your community and seek out what he wants to do in your life. So right now we're going to pray. We're going to pray that God will transform your life. Because right now, Jesus wants to help you and guide you and direct you beyond the circumstances you may see with your own physical eyes, beyond your own hearing and your own logic and the logic and thought and hearing of others. You're going to put on the full armor of God. You're going to be able to move forward into a way that you will see what God is doing. You won't let the roaring lion stop you as he goes around the world, this world full of wickedness. And you will understand why you become new and why this world doesn't love you. And you won't be deceived by the Satan and demonic signs and wonders of this world anymore. By the mighty power of Jesus Christ, you will be changed right now. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you right now. We just ask you to open our eyes, our ears, and our minds to receive what the Holy Spirit wants to bring, that your angels will guide and direct and protect our lives while we pray so this message of the gospel can go around the four corners of the earth. Lord Jesus, we repent of anything that we have done in our lives, in our families, with our friends, our co-workers, the time that we were in school, the things that we've done with our spouse and our kids and our parents and our children that we'll be able to move forward in the way that you call us to go, that we'll be able to love and guide and direct people's steps wherever they may lead. Lord, we pray against these powers of darkness, especially this month of October. As many follow witchcraft and different kinds of deviated things that are accelerated for the month of October through December. Lord Jesus, we just ask you right now to just come about and wrap your loving arms around each one of us. As many of us are asking for healing and guiding and direction for our lives. That you'll be able to move us in such a way that we'll be able to understand where it is you want us to go next. Lord Jesus, we just ask you right now that you'll just come in in such a way that we know beyond a doubt that the situation 
the problems that we've gone through have been resolved by the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That no one will be able to deny the fact that you didn't do this on your own. No one came and rescued you. No one rendered aid. It was a miraculous situation. May the miraculous occur right now across our families, our friends, our co-workers, our businesses, our schools, our homes. While we're driving, while we're eating, while we're communicating. That divine appointments will be placed upon people's lives. That they will have a burning bush-like moment with you, Lord Jesus. That you will reveal the Jesus Christ of Nazareth to them right now in Jesus' name. That we pray against these darknesses and this power on this earth that is trying to deceive the world. That you will hold back the darkness just a little while longer. So someone else can hear the message of the gospel. And not only that, that you'll be able to reach some of their needs in the midst of talking about who the great I am is. And what God wants to do in their lives. Lord, we thank you for dying on the cross. We thank you for the many opportunities that you've given us, that you've guided and directed us. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for who you are and in what you want to do and where you want to lead us. God, thank you so much for all the many blessings that you have given us. May we serve and honor you for the rest of our days of our lives. That we will have a heart and a hunger to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to all that we may encounter. By the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen. Amen.